So as we go through today, I keep this pretty basic because there's no way I'll spend 30 minutes on it, and that's all the time I have. But when we look at the central nervous system, we talk about the brain and basically the brain itself, since we're talking about stroke, and I'll just uh, leave the spinal cord alone. Although you can have a stroke of the spinal cord. There was somebody in surgical that actually had, um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but because of their abdominal injury, they ended up having an altered circulation to the spinal cord and became paralyzed. So, I mean, that would have been a stroke of the spinal cord in that situation. But we're going to basically focus on these areas here. Now, another thing, too, when we get through here uh, is cranial nerves because as we go through and talk about the NIH stroke scale and our assessment, we will talk a lot about cranial nerves because that's a big part of what we assess as far as a stroke is concerned. Starting off here, we'll talk about the prefrontal lobe, which is this area right in here, uh, the brain. And looking down, we realize that it really is the part that allows us to interact with our, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, or whatever, our patients, because it provides us the insight into and also the executive thinking and the emotions that are necessary to just uh, function as a human being. Uh, memory, a lot of the memory is working memory uh, with this part of the brain where we, someone tells you a uh, phone number and you remember it, you dial the number and then you forget it. That's a working memory. Or they give you some information that you work with for a while, you may work all day today with it, but tomorrow it's not necessary for you to keep it anymore. So. <clears throat> you may not retain that memory. This has a lot to do with the frontal lobe. And here are some of the issues that occur whenever you have an injury or a stroke in this area. You have the area here, it's, uh, it's called the orbital frontal uh, part that lies over the orbits of the eye here, and that's where it gets its name. And this is the part of the frontal lobe that has a lot to do with decision-making, emotional regulation, and reward expectation. And we know that a person, I know our, our trauma nurses in here, when you have a patient that has a prefrontal lobe, uh, a frontal lobe injury, these are the ones that are more impulsive, they're more, uh, they're unable to, they're, uh, to delay satisfaction, they're very difficult to work with. Your rehab folks will tell you they're difficult to work with uh, because they cannot focus. Their attention is a big, big issue. Now, in addition to just having the general uh, uh, function of, uh, that we have as far as our interpersonal relationship, our decision making, etc., we also, of course, one of the things we always think about is the frontal cortex here. There's an area right in here where we controls all the movement on the opposite side of the body. And you also have an area for motor. The frontal is motor, so if we can just remember that. And the, you have the motor area here, and it's usually in the dominant side uh, of the hemisphere on the left side, which is uh, for 98 or 99 percent of the folks here, everybody, it's your dominant hemisphere where you have the, uh, a chip, I always think about a little chip being in there that has to do with all the motor uh, muscles that uh, actually decide which muscles you need to use for speech. So it's your expressive area for speech is in this area right here. Now, moving on back to the parietal lobe here, uh, you have your, all your incoming input as far as sensory, somatosensory. So you have an area here, I'll just move on to the next slide for a second. You have an area here in the post uh, area, post central gyrus, this is your parietal lobe, that represents the sensory input for all the opposite side of the body. So all this strip here, you can see uh, the tongue and the face and the hand really takes up almost all that strip there. And then going down in between the hemispheres, you have the lower extremity here 
uh, that is represented, of course, for each side of the body. The, this is your motor, and this is your uh, sensory, so they're very similar. One that lies in the motor uh, area, this is your motor, uh, the uh, homunculus, and this is your postcentral or your sensory area. Now, folks that have a uh, middle cerebral artery, uh, whenever they have a middle cerebral artery stroke, it will involve usually this area here that has to do with the hand here. You'll find those folks with middle cerebral artery, uh, now they can have at the M1 or at the very proximal part of the middle cerebral artery, it may actually encompass everything, but the middle cerebral artery actually is this area here. It will take out the upper arm and the face. You'll see more symptoms in that area. Whereas the anterior cerebral artery, the blood supply there, has more to do with the lower extremity. So when you know the vascular supply to the areas of the brain, you can also denote what type of stroke. But of course now again, there are always some overlap and everybody's not exactly alike. Now let me go back here, as far as sensory, uh, on your non-dominant side, you have incoming information that tells you about your body as it relates to the environment and as it relates to itself. So a person that has a right hemisphere stroke, they will frequently have what's called a neglect or uh, you know, loss of the ability to even recognize the left side of their body. And I always asked here, have y'all ever had any interesting stories about someone that had a neglect? You can also have a neglect where you uh, have, you do not hear or you do not see. So, I mean, you can look at a picture and not really have anything wrong with the, uh, your, uh, your retina or anything wrong with the, your eye or the pathways, but it's your perception that you do not see, and so you may not see half of a, uh, an area. Do y'all, have y'all had any interesting uh, stories of neglect? I have one. Okay, Jennifer. Um, we had a guy who came in and lived, we got a consult for an older mental status, and this, they had found this guy walking through his neighbor's yard, and he had one shoe on, and he had a Okay, that is a good one. I'll have to, I'll use that. I'll steal it from you, Jennifer. <laughs> I think I've got one that'll beat that, though. Guy gets into a car, okay? He opens the door. He gets into a car. And so at the time he got in the car, he had a right hemisphere stroke, okay? So now, you do realize his left hemisphere is working. And if your left hemisphere is working, that guy had an altered mental status. But sometimes people are pretty clear. I mean, they still can articulate. They're still using their right. Uh, they're still using the right side if the left is still working. But this guy had the right hemisphere stroke. So he's driving down the road. His left arm and a left leg are hanging out of the out of the car, and he gets stopped by the police. Same thing with yours walking along without tucking his shirt in on that side. I think, is that not amazing how the brain works? And another thing, too, that happens with that perception with the right hemisphere, it helps us to analyze and know what's going on and make decisions, too. And uh, uh, if you perceive, what do you perceive your body? You can actually deny you have a stroke, period. Someone says, whose hand is that? You say, I don't know, it's Uncle Joe's, okay? They have no concept that that is actually their part of their body uh, because this is broken up here. And the same thing, if you think about it, happens with schizophrenia patients is where they do not have perception of what's going on. And as a result, do you know what happens? They don't take their medicine it's because of their perception, okay? And so there's a lot of overlap between mental illness, actually, and the uh, right hemisphere that, got, that we have, all right? So we'll move on there and talk a little bit about the temporal lobe, okay? 
This uh, course is your general interpretive part for language and for sensory input and for vision. All three, all of your sensory comes together here and we pull it together and we can interpret what's going on around us. So it's very important whenever you have, of course, a, uh, a large stroke that if you have a, um, a stroke, and this is on your uh, dominant side, so this is on your left hemisphere usually, and if you have a stroke that involves this area, of course, you will not be able to actually interpret what is being said. You at that point will have fluent aphasia. You can talk a blue streak, but it probably won't make any sense uh, when you have this type of uh, problem. Now, another thing is memory. We store memories. The hippocampus lies under that. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. And it's also an area in the temporal lobe that has to do with taste and smell. Vision is uh, actually, you have vision, visual pathways that come from the retina, pass all the way through the parietal lobe, go back here into the occipital lobe. So vision, again, is not just the occipital lobe uh, completely. It also involves different integral pathways that have to do with uh, how well we see in visual field effects, etc. We can get visual agnosia where we actually do not identify objects, but you could identify it with touch, but maybe not be able to tell me what this is in my hand. So, you know, vi you have different stroke um, uh, problems too, different vascular uh, issues that can cause you to have problems with vision. Now, of course, you have your uh, visual, one of the things we check with uh, NIH stroke scale is what we're doing is we're looking for visual field effects. So if you had a stroke in an area uh, like here, if you uh, have an ischemic area right here, you can see where you actually have one whole eye will be blind, okay? Whereas in other areas, such as this area here, if your stroke occurred in this area, you're going to have one visual fill, a quarter of your visual uh, fill will be, uh, uh, you'll have a defect in it in each eye. It's according to the way these pathways occur. And this is one of the things that nurses, I think, because I've taught neuro nursing for many years, and we would talk about a visual field effect, but we did not include that that much in our assessment for acute patients in the hospital. This was something that I would see the occupational therapist, the, uh, the, uh, the doctor would some check the uh, visual field effect, the primary person checking on the patient, but nurses did not do this this much. So you have what's called the left brain and right brain, and we can look at that and realize that the right brain gives us the big picture. It kind of helps us to think out of the box, whereas the left brain uh, is more of a logical type of uh, situation there. The cerebellum here, uh, when you have a stroke that involves the cerebellum, it lies very close to the brain stem here. So you have to always think the brain stem and the different factors and different uh, functions that it has because as pressure builds up here, it puts pressure on the brain stem. So this is a very critical, it's a, a red flag thing that occurs when someone has a stroke that's expanding, maybe a bleed here because it's a life and death situation. They will die from just pressure on the brain stem as it in increases. Of course, equilibrium is a big deal here and we assess that with our NIH stroke scale. Now, one of the things we don't talk a lot about with stroke is the diencephalon. And that's your thalamus and your hypothalamus. I think we think of hypothalamus more with uh, traumatic brain injury where you have a patient that has a thermostat, their temperature gets real high. Uh, they always say the thermostat's broke, it doesn't respond uh, to anything. So that is one of your functions of your hypothalamus, is your temperature regulation. Sexual function, et cetera, your diet, uh, your appetite increasing or decreasing. These are things where probably, even if the uh, hypothalamus is involved that much, probably, unless it is the temperature issue uh, regard to a stroke, we're probably not going to address that very much. It'll be looked at more when they get to rehab. Now, your thalamus is a relay station for every incoming 
sensory nerve that goes up to the parietal lobe. The thalamus actually uh, determines where all these nerve fibers, where this information is going to be sent. And sometimes it'll be sent back to the cerebellum. The circuits run different ways here, but it is the recipient for all information. It's also part of the reticular activating center that's in the brain stem that is our an alert center. It's our wake center. If you have a person that has a huge uh, bleed here in the thalamus, this person's probably gonna have a very decreased level of consciousness, okay? So uh, just keep that in mind. Now there's this little area here. I'm gonna move on now to this and I'll bring out that area with this slide. I always think about the patient with a frontal lobe injury, brain, uh, if they've had trauma, but also if they had an anterior cerebral artery uh, bleed. Uh, it's gonna involve more of the frontal lobe here, as we talked about earlier. But one of the things that occur that uh, neuropsychiatrists and neuropsychologists study all the time is our response to fear and how we respond to stress, etc. Well, you had the amygdala, amygdala, amygdala here, and whenever you are frightened, you pick this up, or when there's high stress, it's picked up here. But you see this network that connects with the cingulate gyrus here and with the frontal lobe, the prefrontal lobe. So you get the fear response or the stress response, and it's processed up through here. The cingulate gyrus says, stop, think. It is your brakes, okay? And then your prefrontal lobe helps you to work this out and analyze it. And so we don't all walk around in a state of fear or hyper vigilance or whatever all the time, okay? We're able to manage our stress. Well, the person that has an injury to the prefrontal lobe or have had a stroke that involves this area, one of these mechanisms like the prefrontal lobe, the analysis part, the determining what's going on and saying, okay, let's look at this this way and how we're going to figure out what we're going to do about it. Otherwise, the problem solving problem is the problem solving process is changing and so that's why you get these people that are so impulsive, inappropriate. It has a lot to do with this whole system being broken here, one or more parts after they have a stroke. Now there's a little part here called the hippocampus right here, okay? It's very important as far as memory and your Alzheimer's patients are definitely affected uh, there's deterioration in that area. The temporal lobe lies right over it. So that's where we store memories. And when you have a stroke that involves that area, then you have difficulty in your retention of memory. And in doing this, though, y'all take a nap if you've seen this before, but it fascinates me every time I talk about it. Uh, and I've done it uh, probably a hundred times now. But Henry Mollison, was a, a, a young man, when he was 15 years old, he fell off of a bike and hit his head. And when he did this, afterwards he had intractable seizures. And this was back in the 1950s, and they really had very little uh, anti-seizure medications at that time. There was some that came out in the 1960s. And so during this period of time, he was a young teenager when it happened, and over the next 10 years, his mother was taking care of someone that had seizures all the time. And he would get a job, and maybe they'd be under control for a short period. He could not hold a job. I mean, his life was really, he was having a lot of difficulties, okay? And so there was a doctor up in Connecticut, Hartford, Hartford, Hartford Connecticut, that decided he could help Henry. He worked in conjunction with another doctor in Canada. And so what they did was he decided that uh, if you put some electrodes on here, you could find out exactly where the seizure was taking place, and then you could just remove that little piece of tissue and take care of the seizure. Well, when he got in to do the surgery, 
he really put the electrodes on there and they were unable to identify specifically where it was at. So guess what he did? He took out a slither on both sides of Henry's head, okay? And as a result, afterwards, his mother took him to, uh, uh, when she got him back into his room at some point, he, she took him to the bathroom, and he, uh, after he went to the bathroom, uh, he came back an hour or so later. He had to go to the bathroom again, and he said, well, where's the bathroom? First little key, he had no memory. He was unable to store memory. And um, I do on page, they didn't pay, um, I don't have pages here, I don't think, but let's see. Well, anyway, in the very back of your little handout, at some point, it has books to take on vacation. And this is one of your books. It's by Corkin. And she wrote, Permanent Present Tense, The Unforgettable Life of uh, the Amnesic Patient. Well, after this now, I always think about this mom. She took care of a patient, uh, a son with intractable seizures. Now she was taking care of a son that had no memory. So he could, he wouldn't be safe, would he? I mean, you could not leave someone that didn't have any memory. And Dr. Corkin, who wrote the book on him, studied him for the next, like, 50 years. Uh, after uh, he died when he, was in the night, when he was in his 80s, and he was studied uh, constantly after that for memory. And they would do all these tests on him. They tried to stimulate different memory uh, to encourage, you know, to help him to... Uh, to store memory, and it just didn't work. So they found out a lot about the hippocampus and the uh, temporal lobe just from Henry. Now, as Dr. Corkin would go see him on a monthly basis or so, and she'd take her fellows with her or her other residents to uh, study Henry, and she always introduced herself, I'm Dr. Corkin, and this is so-and-so and so-and-so. And Henry would remember that name for a short period. Remember your front lobe and your working memory. But then the next month when he came, when they came back, I'm Dr. Corkin. This is so and so and so and so and so and so. Over all those years, he never stored their names. Never stored their memory, the memory of their names. So, when you have a stroke that involves this area here, your patient very well could have big issues with their memory. Then you move on to your basal ganglia. That's an area where a lot of intracerebral bleeds take place. And so these patients get varying degrees of uh, paralysis and issues with just mobility. Your brain stem, of course, is a lethal place to have a stroke because it contains your center of uh, uh, breathing. It contains your center for that connects your heart, the medulla, uh, controls your rhythm of the heart, etc. And the cerebral cortex, of course, is your eloquent part of the brain where we've just talked about your temporal lobe, your frontal lobe, etc., where you process information, the amygdala, the limbic system, where you pick up on your anxieties and on your fears, etc. So all that is connected with the brain stem. So when you have a person that's literally uh, I always think about the Enron guy that took our our financial markets to down, caused a lot of us to have a lot of the uh, loss of uh, of uh, financial, you know, things that we had accumulated over the years. When they took him into prison, he fell dead. Okay, that is scared to death or stressed to death. Maybe there was nothing wrong with his heart. But at that point, all the stressors from that, uh, the limbic system, the cerebral cortex, all that connection with your uh, brain stem and the medulla can be overpowering, and as a result, you literally can die. Here we have the, uh, uh, the cerebellum and the brain stem, and you can see there why there's that uh, close anatomical connection where any enlargement or increased pressure in this area will put pressure on your vital centers here. Also, this area here is, of course, your supratentorial above the, um, the cerebellum, 
when you separate out infratentorial is this area and supratentorial is this area up here. Again, this is your eloquent parts of the brain and uh, this is considered a uh, more functional, other functional area there. Your, another important thing about your medulla and your brainstem is that is where all but two of the uh, cranial nerves originate. So just think, cranial nerves here, cerebellum here. So when we go through and talk about swallowing, speech, different issues like that, you realize that if you have a big tumor here in the cerebellum, very likely it will put pressure on here and as a result you can have uh, uh, definitely dis problems with uh, uh, dys dysphagia and with swallowing and aspiration. So here are your cranial nerves, that's your optic, and then your olfactory nerve here. Uh, of course, they do not originate uh, on the brainstem, but all the rest from three down originate from the on the brainstem there. The ventricles, we do have issues with the ventricles. We have your, uh, every day you have 450 milliliters or so of the uh, cerebral spinal fluid that's produced in the ventricles. And then from there, most all of it is absorbed. There's only like 140 milliliters that's actually within the ventricles and flowing around the brain and down around the spinal cord. So, you know, anything that impedes the reabsorption in the choroid plexus in the ventricle, all this cerebral spinal fluid, like if you get blood after a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you guys that are on North Wing 9 or take care of these and also, uh, of course, in the neuro unit in trauma when you, uh, in the other units when you have these patients, these are the patients with the blood there that actually do not reabsorb. Uh, it impedes the reabsorption of cerebral spinal fluid, so they end up getting what's called a communicating hydrocephalus, and we have to put a shun in those folks in order to remove the cerebral spinal fluid. Sometimes they uh, have a external ventricular drain initially, and then at other times they will go home uh, with a uh, intraventri uh, with a, uh, a shun in. So we'll skip over the spinal cord right now. Just mention that the autonomic nervous system does come into play. Uh, the peripheral, I mean, the parasympathetic nervous system, as we sit here today, is regulating our heart. Probably most of us have a heart rate from 60 to 80. It's because of the action of the parasympathetic nervous system to keep everything at status quo, our gut motility is functioning. We uh, have uh, normal innervation to our, uh, uh, our gut and also to our uh, bladder, etc., that controls that, our breathing. All of that is the common everyday function of the body. But when we have patients with a stroke, then we start having issues with, with all this, particularly urination and defecation. So it's just something to keep. This is nursing 101 that we take care of these patients and take care of their basic needs. But when they come through into the ED with a, uh, an acute ischemic stroke, their sympathetic nervous system a lot of times is gone into overdrive at that point. And their blood pressure may be 240 over 120. And so at that point is when we uh, uh, help them to calm down. And after they relax a little bit, their blood pressure a lot of times will come on down. At other times, we have to give them medication to help that along. But we try to keep patients from going into this fight and flight mode uh, while they are in ICU and after they uh, tra are transported to the floor and everything by providing a calming ap atmosphere and also avoiding things that might uh, cause this uh, actually to uh, initiate this response. Well, we'll move on now into and do a little bit on the uh, NIH stroke scale. And Dr. Shirelatine, uh, if y'all haven't been to his uh, presentation, he does an excellent uh, uh, job at this. So how many of y'all been to hear Dr. Shirelatine? We still have a few people that need to do that. In order to get your certificate, 
for NIH stroke scale, you have to go through his uh, presentation. And you get a badge then and a certificate, don't you? <laughs> he does a real good job. I like to hear him too. I always like, every time I hear him, I learn something uh, different. I just pick up something different. But, you know, for years we just used the Glasgow Coma Scale, and until then people would say things like obtunded. I mean, you didn't even know if you got a report on a patient you didn't really have any objective data to evaluate either their improvement or their deterioration. So Teasdale and Jeanette came out with the Glasgow Coma, and, of course, we look at the eyes and their verbal response there and their motor response. And then... <clears throat> About, uh, in about the same time that TPA came, came out, we came out with the NIH stroke scale. They, this has actually been studied and researched. And what it does, it's not just the, the Glasgow coma has to do with pathology that involves pretty, uh, well, not just one hemisphere, but both hemispheres. Because what happens you to decrease your level of consciousness and go into a comatose state, you either have to have both hemispheres involved or the brain stem. So, I mean, that's what we're looking for with the Glasgow coma is deterioration after a intracerebral bleed or a stroke. Maybe they convert and have cerebral edema or maybe a bleed after uh, having TPA or whatever. But with this, we're trying to actually pick up on the stroke. What is the focal symptom that would indicate this person had a stroke? And it would give you a cue to where it was actually occurring. So this is your uh, NIH uh, stroke scale. If you'll tag that, if you have not already done this online, you can get a, a couple of CME, uh, CMEs on it. But everyone is supposed to complete this. It takes, uh, who wants to tell me how long it took them? How long? One hour? Uh, many hours. Many hours of my life. <laughs> Renee says many hours of her life. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer, what do you think? Two to three hours. At least two hours. I mean, and that's if you probably, uh, if you don't do the tutorial, and you, like Jennifer would already be familiar with it. But even if you're familiar with it and you sit down to do it, uh, she does it all the time. And a lot of y'all do it a lot too. But if you sit down to do that, you know, it still will take you one to two hours, no matter what. You cannot cut it down. I can't. It still takes me. And, uh, but Renee says hours. <laughs> Well, you probably fall asleep about midway during the assessment. Then. I know if you don't get every little piece of it. Yeah. It, oh, it makes you furious, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I've actually missed it too. Okay. Uh, you get distracted just a little bit and you'll miss something and then you won't get it right. Okay. So this right here is what you need to tag to do. All right. If you hadn't done it. Now, as far as the Glasgow coma, here again is your reticular activating system here, and notice how it, it goes up through the thalamus here and on up into your other, uh, the cerebral hemispheres up here. And so this tells you about how alert the patient is, okay? Are they alert? Are they sitting up looking around? Are they looking you in the eye, et cetera? And so it goes down uh, to where they only are responding maybe to uh, reflex uh, response or they could even have uh, some uh, extensor reflexes or decortical. All of this is if you do not get at least a one, you could probably continue to do some on a two if this is, they're not alert, but you can continue to stimulate them. But if they're a three by default, you're not going to be able to do pretty much any of the rest of the uh, NIH stroke scale. You could do some of the, uh, it, how they, their eyelid, if it responds to movement or something like that, but it uh, would be difficult. Now, of course, this is pretty cut and dry, just asking these questions, and it's similar to the Glasgow coma, too, because you asked them their orientation to time, place, and person. This is your, asked them the month of the year and their age. 
Here you ask them to perform a couple of tasks and if they do that correctly. So at this point, you are actually determining how well both hemispheres of the brain are working, how alert they are, etc. Now you get to another area. Nurses in general have always been fixated on pupils, right? What is this pupil? What do you think this is? Is this a two? Is it sluggish? Is it whatever? So we're big on that. But sometimes we have neglected and probably do not use it all the way. Uh, 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 every time we do a neuro assessment is to check the extraocular movement. I think we ask them to look up, down, this way, and that way. We'll probably do that a lot of times when we, right after we do the pupils. But with this, what you're doing is particularly if you have a middle cerebral artery uh, infarct there, you will a lot of times get an altered best gaze. Otherwise, it involves the sixth cranial nerve and the third cranial nerve. The sixth is your abducens nerve, number six. And if you think about the ear, number six, looking outward toward the ear, that's your number six cranial nerve. So what we're doing here is having the, Susan, you know, I'll use you as a guinea pig, okay? Just look this way, back, and this way, and back. That's pretty much what you're looking for with a stroke because if they have a stroke in the left hemisphere, they actually, they will, you will notice that they will look toward the stroke. And that's because the pathways for movements is, is interrupted and so uh, you'll get that fixed gaze with these patients, and that's what you're looking for, a partial or a forced gaze, total gaze. So that would be a two. If everything else is normal, they could still have a two, and that could be a big issue with them. Just a little bit more on cranial nerves, your number four, you really don't have to check it with this, but if you think about your nose being a four and you look downward and inward, that's your number four cranial nerve. That's your trochlear nerve. And then, of course, your number three, your ocular motor, also has to do with the ability of the eye to constrict and holding the eye open. So that, you know, the ocular motor is kind of your biggie as far as cranial nerves and its actions. Now, another thing we do is that we didn't always, I don't remember ever doing this in ICU with a patient until I started doing the NIH stroke scale and working with stroke patients. But you always, you know, when the people go to rehab after a stroke, they would always check this out to see what kind of deficits the person had. But you want visual acuity. And I think even basically on our trauma patients or whatever, we need a baseline, can the patient see or not? So Susan, close your right eye. Okay, how many fingers do you see? Two of them. How many here? Two. Two. Okay. I think you missed one, Susan. I'm just teasing. <laughs> okay. Just at least allow the patient hold up an object or something. Know that your patient can see. But what I was checking her for then was her central or medial part of vision. So the other thing you do is cover your right eye. Okay. Look straight at my nose here. Now tell me when you see my fingers move. They don't have to tell you how many fingers. You're looking for a visual field effect. Now, is this important? What if this patient uh, has one half of their visual field missing or one quarter? You know, it could be that that might be their main stroke symptom, but, you know, that also could interfere with them driving. That could change their life, just having a visual field effect. So this is what, according to different areas of ischemia, that you will end up with different uh, uh, visual field effects there. So then you look, is it just one quadrant here? Is it just one of these right here? Or is it uh, two quadrants? Is there uh, one whole half? Or is it in both eyes that they have the visual field effect? So according to that, of course, you score the patient and give them a score. Anyone that this would be very detrimental to a person. And I mean, just uh, so think about it. When you're looking at the NIH stroke scale and you end up completing your NIH stroke scale and you say, oh, they just have a three. It's not very high. I guess it's not very bad. 
but they can't see on each side. So you see we have to look at that. How detrimental is it to the patient? And then you have your facial nerve, number seven, that has to do with your ability to smile. How often, Jennifer, uh, have y'all had a patient that's come in that you've, uh, that's had the facial weakness that you've considered that they might have Bell's palsy? Too, too often? You should not be admitted for it. So how do y'all tease that out? Where they cannot wrinkle their eyebrow and everything. Yeah. So I did have a patient, though, that I went in to see up there on North Wing 7. And I said, I've just come in to do some education on your stroke. Tell me what's happening. And they said, he hadn't had a stroke. Okay. And I said, well, what's happening? He said, well, he has Bell's palsy. So he had been worked up. Okay. But it takes somebody with experience. Uh, to be able to tease that out because you have a branch that goes up here, the facial nerve, that is also included in your Bell's palsy patient. You know, their eye doesn't close good and they can't wrinkle their eyebrow, et cetera, up here. And whereas most of your stroke patients are going to involve uh, the lower part of the uh, face here. So everybody give me a big smile and show me your teeth. Okay. Well, a few years ago I was doing... Um, I was thinking about this. I always kind of laugh. I was doing uh, registration out at Chattanooga State, and this girl walked up, and she had this big phone, and she said, I'm ready to register. And she did not have a tooth in her. She had about three teeth. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I said, there's something wrong with this picture. Big phone, no teeth. But I think in the South, we like our phones, don't we? And if it means no teeth and have a phone then that's what we're going to do. So sometimes you don't, you have to be careful about asking people to show me your teeth, right? Just be careful about that. Anyway, uh, you can have a complete paralysis, upper and lower face. In rare situations, like we said, that has to be teased out as far as having a Bell's policy. But this is what we're going to mostly see, a partial paralysis of the lower face. And that is your number seven cranial nerve. Now, when we get to this, think about it. A patient's going to pocket their food, right? So if they pocket their food, they're at risk for uh, aspiration. This is the first cranial nerve that I've mentioned so far that has to do with potential for aspiration or dysphagia. Okay? So we'll move on there. Now, we go on to the more motor uh, cortex and this would have to do with the frontal cortex there where we were talking about uh, that the homunculus and that area that is represented uh, for the uh, upper extremity and for the lower extremity. So, of course, all of y'all, this is sort of uh, redundant for 98% of you, I guess. But you start out with no drift, so they hold it up for 10 seconds, okay? Then when it drifts down below, it will drift a little bit so they get a one, okay? Then it drifts down to the bed, okay? That would give you a two. And then you kind of hold it up and it, no gravity at all. The limb falls, okay? Now, number four, the way I understand this is if you compress the nail bed or, or pinch the back of the uh, shoulder here, in here, you'll get a little bit of movement there, okay? So there will be... Uh, if there's no movement at all to any stimulation, then they would have a four. Now, what if they have an amputation? Then you're going to give them a five, but you're also going to have a note, and this is going to be told to the, whoever's treating the patient. They got a five, but, okay? You see what I'm saying? You have to, you can't take any test or assessment and not look at the patient as a whole. So they, if they have a five, and it's because of an amputation that would, of course, needs to be clarified there. And you do the same thing with the lower extremity going from just holding the leg up for five seconds down to if they had an amputation or a joint fusion, et cetera, cannot move that leg then to give them a five. That needs to be clarified. No movement, of course, no response to any kind of stimulus would be a four. 
Now, ataxia is another thing that I think nurses over the years have not always assessed. And just general in general, in the acute care environment, we always do this in primary care if you're doing a physical, you want to check out the person's cerebellum to see if they have any ataxia if you're doing a good neuro exam. So Susan, just uh, uh, touch my finger and touch your nose. And I'm going to stand back where she kind of has to stretch there, okay? She's got very good coordination, all right? The other thing you would do is take your heel, slide it down the opposite extremity, and back up like that, down and up. If the patient goes all over the, all over the place, then I grant you he's probably got a cerebellar problem. If you had them in primary care, if they could stand, you could do a Romberg exam where you hold them, their hands out like this, have them to close their eyes, give them a little tap on the shoulder, and see if they can regain their balance if there's any issue there. Okay, but and gait, the way a person walks. But for the most part, this is what we're doing with the NIH stroke scale uh, as we assess the patient and check out their cerebellum. Now, parietal lobe. Okay, here we have that, again, we have this sensory strip there that represents every particle of our body on the opposite side. And you have receptors in the skin on your, uh, on your uh, left side that's related to your, uh, that is connected to your right hemisphere. And it actually, in that little strip there, it helps, you can actually distinguish, you have the receptors and then that information is sent back if you do sharp dull, if I do sharp dull on Susan, on her upper extremity, on her face, I used to break a Q-tip in two. You could take a sterile needle and touch the patient, okay, and do a sharp test. But you're going to test out and see if she has any numbness that would indicate a representation uh, in this part of the brain here. I remember... Uh, having a guy with a brain tumor one time in the parietal lobe up here, that his only symptom was numbness of a part of his mouth. So you can understand, you could have numbness of, a, of the hand, the upper extremity, and it could indicate that there had been a stroke in that area there. So you do a sharp dull of the face, upper extremities, and lower extremities. That is your sharp dull. Now, I usually at this point would do, I would say, Susan, close your eyes, and I would touch her face. I'm not going to touch your face right now. But I would touch the uh, left shoulder. Just tell me when I'm touching, what I'm touching. Am right. I what? Left. Say it left. 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 What am I touching now? Right. What am I touching now? Both. Both. Okay. Now, you're distinguishing where it's located when you just touch I mean, you're doing this uh, like you've already done the sharp dull, and a person might be able to distinguish that you have touch in one extremity or the other, but in order to actually identify that you recognize that your, your left side is part of your own body, you would be able to distinguish right and left, okay? So when you touch at the same time, that's what you're looking for is a neglect when you touch both sides in the upper extremity and the lower extremity. Sometimes I would go ahead and do that now rather than waiting till later for the part that is on your NIH stroke scale. Other things that the parietal lobe tells you is your position like in space, like you have to close the eyes, raise up one finger like this, and have them to tell you is your finger up or down. What position is it? Can they identify uh, different objects you place in their hands with their eyes closed? These are all things that the parietal lobe uh, helps you to interpret. But for this, for right now, what we basically do with the NIH stroke scale are these right here. So you have mild to moderate sensory loss, severe or total sensory loss. If they could not identify any touch on one side of their body, that would be severe. But if they have some... Uh, sensory loss that you pick up that is not uh, a total sensory loss, you give them a one. Now, what if they couldn't feel in the tips of their fingers? I mean, is that always a real bad thing? If it was a 90-year-old uh, man and, you know, he couldn't 
feel on the tips of his fingers. Maybe it's his non-dominant fingers. Might not be as big a problem, but if the person ends up having no sensation in his uh, fingers and he's a guitar player, might be a big difference, right? You have to look at what what disability is occurring because of this specific thing. So if you go through, again, you add up your score, and at the end you've got a 2, and the only thing that's wrong with this patient is severe or total sensory loss in a particular area of the uh, extremity. And that might you might even call that a 1 because it doesn't involve a large area. But still, for that person, it would be a big disability. So you would think more on treating that person aggressively. Now, other things that that uh, right parietal lobe has to do, this is your non-dominant side, but when they go to rehab, one of the things with a right parietal lobe, and of course in conjunction with the frontal lobe too, they work together there. These patients have problems with neglect. We talked about that. But also dyscalculo, not being able to like, you'll ask them to count back by sevens from 100, multiply, whatever, uh, you know, just calculating uh, math and things like that. A lot of times they have issues with that. Apraxia is where they're unable to carry out activities of daily living, like dressing themselves, putting together a sequence of motor things together, uh, like brushing your teeth, feeding yourself, all those things. When you have an issue with the parietal lobe, the non-dominant side, you have a lot of times what's called apraxia. Now, the trigeminal nerve uh, has to do not only with sensory here, when I was, uh, if I had checked uh, Susan's sensory uh, uh, ability to identify touch in her face, that is the trigeminal nerve. But in addition, it also has to do with chewing, mastication. So again, we have another cranial nerve that has to do with chewing that can affect our ability to swallow. If we cannot chew up our food well, then we're more likely to uh, aspirate. Sensory limb or the corneal reflex, also our patients with a stroke, we have to protect their eye. And if the um, trigeminal nerve is damaged, then uh, they may not close their eye well and then get a corneal abrasion. Now, moving on to language, we check out their language. We're looking for a Broca's language and Bernicke's language. What is happening here, when we have them to look at this picture and tell us what's going on, we're going to be checking several things. One thing is uh, we are going to see... Uh, they will attempt, if it's Broca's aphasia, they will attempt to tell us what's going on, okay? With Broca's aphasia, that person usually does not use vowels well, okay? And vowels and adjectives is what give our language actually a lot of uh, uh, important information when you're trying to communicate with another person. So that person may just say one word. I know uh, Professor Broca, that this is named after Broca's area of the brain, his patient that he studied, the only word that man could say was tan, T-A-N, okay? And uh, uh, so you have different people, be it a stroke or traumatic brain, whatever, that have issues with Broca's area and not being able to express Okay, now these people understand, they just cannot tell you what they're saying. And so they get very emotional, a lot of times very tearful, etc. So anyone that could just say one word, of course, and were still attempting to express themselves would have severe aphasia. They're going to be telling you what's going on here. And if they completely ignore this part here, then you're going to pick up at this point, they probably have a visual neglect. They are looking at the picture, but they're only seeing half the picture. So this is another thing you're going to be looking at at the same time. Now, Wernicke is when you ask that person something, they will come out and they will just have a, they'll just say, you'll say, well, what's in the picture? And they'll say, well, 
the football was going this way and that way, and then it went over my head and then down here. And you say, well, I don't really understand what you're saying. But, you know, they're just, it'll be, they're fluent. Their language is fluent. They use verbs, they use nouns, but they have are clueless about what you are asking them. And so they do respond, but it makes no sense. So that would be your vernicis aphasia. Now you get to dysarthria, and this is where they speak usually fluently, but you can always think about dysarthria being different phases like you're drinking. A person drinks a little bit, and they might drink, speak kind of slowly, okay? But they get to a point where you really, they're fluent, but you can't understand a word they're saying, okay? So they go from being mild to severe dysarthria. Again, what if you went through here and you ended up with a 2, okay, on the NIH stroke scale? You'd say, oh, he had a minor stroke, right? Would you? He had a 2, and it was because of dysarthria. That would be severe for that patient. In fact, I heard recently of a guy, and I hope to meet him soon, but that uh, one of the other hikers that I hike with was telling me about a guy that was a CEO over a large company in Chattanooga, and this was 20 years ago, and he had a stroke and ended up with severe dysarthria. And he went from, uh, they just said that he was, that he had enough, uh, uh, financial well-being and everything that after that he never he actually just became a uh, he actually never returned to his position he couldn't he couldn't speak anymore and he essentially does not talk at all okay so but he's been become a real good biker and hiker okay over these years you don't have to speak to do either one of those but as you see that could be very disabil that'd be a great disability and what is happening here is those cranial nerves, number ten, 9 and number 10, have to do with speech and swallowing. So if you have a brainstem stroke uh, that ends up involving those, that's where it's going to show up mostly with dysarthria. These people are going to be totally alert. They're going to know what's going on. You can tell by the interaction but will not be able to express, uh, not be able to talk a lot of times if they have really severe dysarthria. But these are two of your cranial nerves. Now we don't always, uh, this didn't include the NIH stroke scale, but your speech therapists check out these cranial nerves very carefully. The tongue is another one that would have to do with uh, swallowing. So that would be evaluated too. And then extinction. While we've been, uh, while I was uh, checking Susan out, I was actually seeing if she, when I was on her right side, if she was looking toward me as far as hearing. On the left side, you can have a uh, neglect also in hearing. Well, I checked on her sensory as far as her ability to identify and distinguish between right and left at the same time when you're touching their body. Uh, you look at the, when they're interpreting different visual things you give them, you're trying to pick up on visual uh, inattention or extinction. So then you can determine if they are profoundly or have maybe just one area that you pick up on uh, that uh, they have a neglect. Someone told me just another little story about neglect. She had a uh, concussion. It was one of, actually a nurse, she came to one of my uh, uh, sessions here. And she said that, uh, uh, I think she had a fracture too or maybe a pretty severe trauma. Something happened. Then they sent her home. And so her concussion really hadn't been addressed that much because she came through that pretty good. But after she went home, her sister told her one day, said, Jean, do you realize you never shave your left leg? I mean, now that would tell you that you just, it's just in neglect. The brain is not picking up that that is your left side that belongs to you. Might be a minor thing, and you didn't even notice it. It looked pretty weird if you had big black hairs on one side and none on the other. Okay. All right. So, a fact, just another little thing. A factory is your temporal lobe. 
uh, just a little thing, because a lot of y'all take care of uh, traumatic brain injured patients, but you get these patients with basilar skull fractures in the and the anterior part of the face. They all, this right here is something that happens to them because of those nerve fibers that go into the nose and everything. Frequently, they will have a problem with smell afterwards. And then your acoustic, you do indirectly assess that as you're talking to the patient. But also, a lot of patients, after a stroke, have vestibular issues, okay? I mean, they have problems with balance. You just talk to stroke patients, not uh, maybe why, even before they go, uh, go, leave the hospital, they won't always be aware of it. But during rehab and afterwards, uh, when you've hurt, you, when your brain has been injured, uh, then this is often a problem. Spinal accessory, everybody raise your shoulders for me like this. Stretch real good. Move your face this way. Move your face this way. I love to do this while I'm doing a physical exam because I get to do it several times a day if I'm doing a lot of physicals. That is your spinal accessory nerve, okay? What does that have to do with stroke? Well, if you go in and your patient cannot raise their neck good, then that will influence their ability to swallow. So that's another cranial nerve that has to do with dysphagia that they, and potential aspiration. All right, so here's your NIH stroke scale. And you notice here the powers that be say one to four is a minor stroke. I hope I have changed your mind on that. If you can't speak, if you can't see, if you can't feel with the tip of your fingers, you may have a two, okay? That's not minor for you, is it? So you have to think about that. And our doctors do think about that, our neurologists. That's why it's important to come to a hospital where, uh, and our nurse practitioners that see these patients. Uh, they do consider that a major thing and look at it as an option for treatment. And we're doing studies on that for even uh, strokes that are resolving very rapidly to treat those aggressively just to help prevent those uh, disabilities. So here's another thing to look at. Anytime you get a 15 plus on your NIH stroke scale, it means you've got a large vessel stroke. And these patients that what we, when we have a large vessel strokes, we want all of these patients to come to Erlanger because this is where we can treat large vessel strokes. Now, minor strokes, what you would call minor, can be treated at outlying hospitals and eventually we'll probably, we get so many stroke patients here that all of them that are large vessel strokes need to come to us because we have interventions that we can go in and remove those big clots. Now, again, assessment, assessment, assessment is all I've got to say. That's your, best, uh, that's your best form, that's your best tool that you've got that, to use with these patients. And when you have a patient with a stroke, they can develop complications. So you're going to be doing the NIH stroke scale in the emergency room before you do any treatment. You're going to be doing it when you first admit them to the ICU, to the floor then you're going to be doing it at least every 12 hours. But meantime, you're going to be monitoring that patient for complications and, uh, and by using the Glasgow Coma Scale. And of course, we do the verbal on that. We look for the patient falling commands. We uh, look for them to localize. If they're in the ICU, they would be in the ICU probably at this point here, withdrawing from pain. And then the worst scenario, of course, would be uh, being decorticate or decerebrate or have flexion, uh, flexor uh, contractures like this or extensors like this. Both of these, decorticate indicates that your cerebral cortex is injured and the decerebrate indicates that your brain stem is injured, okay? And then when you become flaccid, no response at all, just atonic, no tone, that means that your brain stem, it's an indication of brain death. Although I cannot say the person is brain dead at that point, you have to go through the whole criteria. But being flaccid in this situation is one of the indications. That preliminary, along with not having uh, cranial nerves like coughing, uh, corneal reflex, all those would be gone too. Uh, but then again, you still have to do more extensive 
uh, workup to determine brain death. So here is your motor. Your uh, this is very similar to the pers to the what the physical therapist does. It's what we actually do. We just kind of do it in reverse for the NIH stroke scale. Breathing is very important. When you've got a patient that's had a stroke, then you're going to monitor the respirations carefully because the pons is very similar, very sensitive to increased pressure. Why does the patient have increased pressure after a stroke? Even an ischemic stroke, well, they can develop cerebral edema, they can develop a bleed afterwards, and they're just not out of the woods for like uh, probably 48 hours or so that you're going to watch these people very carefully. And one of the things that is very that will show up is a change in respiratory pattern. Also, look for your increases in blood pressure as the patient starts uh, getting pressure within the brain. The bradycardia also is a late sign where they brady down. And then Cushing's is where uh, you've, it's gone almost too far at this point. It's where you have a widening pulse pressure and definitely at this point a bradycardic uh, presentation uh, with Cushing's. Aca, the pupils are important, yes, and particularly when you're watching for increased intracranial pressure, knowing the baseline of the pupil, 20% of the population have abnormal pupils anyway. One's a little bit larger than the other, et cetera. Maybe they've had cataract surgery, there's something abnormal there. But uh, anyway, just realize different sizes, particularly small or uh, pinpoint. Here you have the pontine presentation. And we are all very familiar, of course, with the ocular motor where the pupil's dilated and not responsive. Or if it's becoming sluggish is what we need to look at early. Uh, and then the small equal and reactive for a diencephalon. Just know your baseline of your patient and monitor those for changes. And then we have here, I was just telling Renee, or who was I telling? Oh no, I didn't tell you, Renee. I was up in uh, MICU. I was up there with students a week or so ago. And so for y'all that aren't in ICU, <clears throat> I'm sure Renee is probably helps with this a lot of times uh, whenever you have a patient determining brain dead. So you have this stroke patient come in and they have, they end up, they have no corneal reflexes, they have no gag reflexes, they have no cough reflexes. They're always intubated, of course, because they're <clears throat> really at an advanced stage of deterioration at this point. So we're determining is, and then they're flaccid. There's absolutely no tone. You lift their arm up and it's just flaccid like that. So we're determining if they have brain death in order to take them off the ventilator or to prepare them for organ donation. Well, let me just say this, it's not a cut and dry situation. You have a whole protocol here that you have to go through to, before you can get to the point where you can actually determine a patient had brain death. But one of the things you can do is check them for doll's eyes. And if the brain stem is functioning, when you turn the head to the right, the eyes will move back in the opposite direction. Here, if you turn them to the left, the eyes move back to the opposite direction. You know, we looked at that ocular motor and abducent nerve and the way it connects. So when you move in, in a comatose patient, this is what happens. And it's much like the old dolls that their eyes were on a spring and when you move their eyes. So you would say that patient demonstrates uh, doll's eyes. Okay, that means they have brain stem functioning. But down here, one eye goes one way and the one guy, eye goes the other way when you move the head. Well, guess what? They still have some brain stem functioning because the eye has moved even though it's been pathological and it's not been normal. But down here is what happened to the lady the other day, uh, uh, it's a couple of weeks ago, when we checked her. I went ahead, they had already done the calorics, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I showed the students how this works. When you move the head to the right, there was no movement at all. Nothing happened. Everything was just stationary. It's an indication of brain death. Now here is what they had just done. I missed seeing this because I was out and just had walked back in. But they put cold uh, water in the ear here. And if you put cold in, 
The eyes will move in the opposite direction, but they rapidly will move back toward the external auditory canal that you put the water in. That means there's brain stem functioning. There's a connection between the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibular area, and the ocular motor nerve there. So it will call, it will trigger the eyes to move. This is a normal response. This is some brain stem functioning. One eye moved, the other one didn't. And down here, nothing happened. So that's an indication of brain death. And last but not least, some doctors will elect to do the uh, brain scan where they put a radioisotope in the, in the vein. And when the uh, radioisotope gets up to the brain area, you see there is no blood flow there. So that would be another thing you could use to help determine and uh, brain death. These patients have to be off all sedatives. They can't be on anything. Their carbon dioxide level has to be okay. They do a apnea test on them, take them off the ventilator, etc. Everything's not all that simple all the time because you have to have all the ducks in a row before you can actually determine the brain death. Okay, so what do you think? Another break? Ten minutes. Okay. Come back at 10 minutes to 11. Let's see. That's right. It's a little bit more than that. Okay. Move along. Ryan, how's it going? What's your name? Cody. What? You look like somebody. Cody. What is Cody. Do I look like Ryan Cool? Did anybody ever ask you that? No, you but he worked on mine. Yeah. No, do you know what? Uh, what was his name? What? 